On March 10th, 2025, a cargo ship traveling through the North Sea crashed into an oil tanker at full speed, ripping a massive hole in its side. The tanker's inner and outer hulls were breached, allowing water to rush into the ship and flood the cargo area. But somehow, it not only didn't sink, it remained stable and upright. You might be wondering how that's possible. Believe it or not, the answer takes us back to the most famous shipwreck of all time, the Titanic. The first thing you need to know about are bulkheads. Bulkheads are steel walls set up to split the ship's hull into different watertight sections. So if the hull gets damaged and starts leaking, the flooding stays contained to a small area. Out of all the bulkheads, the one at the front is the most important. When people crash their cars, they usually find that most of the damage is on their front bumpers because people tend to crash into things that are in front of them. For similar reasons, the bow of a ship is the spot that's most likely to get damaged, so this front bulkhead is built to keep water from flooding in. That's why it's called the collision bulkhead, and it's thicker than the other ones to handle more force. But it's not just about being strong. Where this bulkhead is located matters too. If it's too close to the bow, it could get damaged during impact, making it useless. But if it's too far back, the forward compartment becomes too large, so when it fills with water after a collision, the bow could sink too low, resulting in excessive trim. If you're not familiar with the term, trim refers to how low the front of the bow sits in the water compared to the stern. If one end is significantly lower than the other, the deck might come dangerously close to the waterline or even submerge. When that happens, vents and other openings might let water in, which could lead to the ship sinking. The same principle applies to the rest of the bulkheads. On one hand, if they're spaced too far apart, the watertight compartments they create become larger. This means if the hull gets damaged, more water can rush into one compartment which increases the risk of losing stability or even sinking. On the other hand, if the bulkheads are too close together, that means there are too many compartments. This not only adds unnecessary structural weight, but also makes the ship less efficient by limiting the usable space. So, the goal is to find the best way to arrange these bulkheads, and it's much easier than it sounds thanks to computers. We start by defining a margin line an imaginary line that's usually drawn about three inches, or 76 millimeters, below the deck line. Then we use a computer-based model to simulate filling the hull with water and see how much water the ship can take before the margin line reaches sea level. The length of this flooded area is called the floodable length. Now, remember that although this simulation is much faster with computers today, the underlying mechanics are still the same as when people did it by hand. What happened was, we assumed that this section of the hull had been damaged and flooded. Remember what we learned in school? An object floats in water because of buoyancy, which is equal to the weight of the water it displaces. Before it gets damaged, that section helps keep the ship afloat by displacing water. But once it's damaged and starts flooding, it stops contributing to buoyancy. This leads to two things happening. First, since the ship's weight stays the same, but its buoyancy is reduced, the boat sinks deeper and displaces more and more water until the buoyancy matches the weight. That's called parallel sinkage. Second, the center of buoyancy shifts. The center of buoyancy is the same as the center of the displaced water volume. Since the damaged section isn't displacing water anymore, the center of buoyancy moves, in this case, to the right. But the ship's center of gravity remains the same, which creates a misalignment between buoyancy and weight. This gives us a turning moment, making the stern sink more while the bow rises. As mentioned earlier, this is called trim, and it shifts the center of buoyancy back to the left until it lines up again with the ship's center of gravity, bringing everything to a new equilibrium. This combined effect of parallel sinkage and trim lowers the margin line towards sea level. Whether we're doing it by hand or with computer, 
What we're figuring out is the maximum length the flooded section can be before the margin line hits sea level. Once we've done the calculation for one part of the ship, we repeat it along the centre length. As you'll notice, it takes more water for the margin line in the middle to touch sea level. That's because it takes less water to bring the margin line down at the front and back of the ship because of the trim. Flooding near the centre causes the ship to sink straight down with little to no trim. Once we've done this for the entire hull, we get what's called the floodable length curve. If the floodable length at a certain point is, say, 10 metres, that means the length of a compartment centred there needs to be less than 10 metres. Otherwise, a breach at that spot could make the deck go under. There's a simple way to check this on paper, even without a computer. Take the floodable length curve and draw a vertical line from the centre of a compartment equal to its length. If that line stays below the floodable length curve, then the compartment is shorter than the floodable length at that point. To put it another way, if the compartment is 8 metres wide between bulkheads and the floodable length curve above the centre of that compartment is 10 metres, this tells us that even if this compartment gets breached, it won't sink the ship. What we've discussed so far is part of what's called damage stability, which focuses on how the ship behaves after an accident. For a long time, this didn't get the attention it deserved. And then the Titanic sank. Two years after the Titanic tragedy, a convention was held in London to tackle the safety of life at sea, commonly known as the Solus Convention. At first, the main focus was making sure all passengers and crew had access to lifeboats. But in subsequent years, Solus went a lot further. Today, thanks to Solus, just arranging bulkheads so that a damaged ship can stay afloat isn't enough. Designers have to make sure that the compartments between the bulkheads will keep the ship stable and upright in normal sea conditions, giving people enough time to evacuate safely. So, how do we make sure of that? Well, Solus dictates that ship designers have to imagine a worst-case scenario when evaluating the safety of their vessels. First, they have to take it as given that one or two compartments have already been flooded because of an accident. Second, they have to factor in the possibility that all the passengers are gathered on one side of the ship. Third, it makes designers imagine that a wind is pushing from the opposite side of the ship, creating what's known as a healing force that could capsize the vessel. And fourth, they have to assume that all the lifeboats on that side are fully loaded and ready to go. If the vessel shows enough stability under these conditions, it's considered safe. This kind of assessment is called the deterministic approach. It assumes a severe condition and checks if the vessel can handle it. A pretty solid way to measure safety, right? Well, in reality, accidents rarely follow that sort of predictable pattern. So modern ship design also uses a more sophisticated method, the probabilistic approach. To explain the difference between deterministic and probabilistic, let's use a simple example. Imagine we're testing the durability of different smartphone models. We decide to drop each phone from a height of 5 feet, and if they don't crack, we say they're tough. Seems like a solid method, right? We've set a fixed condition, 5 feet, and checked the result. That's the deterministic approach. But what we should also ask is, how likely is it that someone will drop their phone from approximately 5 feet in the first place? We need to think about the probability of that scenario actually happening. A probabilistic approach takes this into account by looking at not just the outcome of a specific scenario, but also how likely that scenario is to happen. It's the same principle in ship design. Instead of assuming one specific damage scenario, the probabilistic method considers how likely it is that each of the compartments between the bulkheads will be breached and evaluates the ship's survivability in each case. This gives a more overall assessment of the ship's safety based on a range of outcomes, not just one. To do this, we calculate a survival factor called the subdivision index. A. This is the sum of the likelihood or probability 
of different damage scenarios, P, multiplied by how likely the ship will survive that damage or the survivability. S, to know if a ship will be safe after a collision, we need to work out the probability and survivability of every part of the ship that could potentially get damaged. For instance, a longer compartment has a higher chance of being hit in a collision just because it's a bigger target. On ships with double hulls, which we talked about in a previous video, the outer compartments are more exposed than the inner ones, making them more likely to get hit. Plus, statistical data shows that damage from collisions usually happens more at the front and bottom of the ship, so those spots get higher P factors. To go through everything these calculations have to consider would take a lot more time than we have in this video. But you get the idea. The probabilistic approach is a more realistic and thorough method compared to the deterministic approach. But the downside is the massive number of calculations needed to cover all possible scenarios. In the past, this was a major challenge. Not only because of limited computational tools, but also because many naval architects weren't familiar with probabilistic concepts. But today, modern computers and specialized software have made these complex calculations manageable, allowing this method to be part of regular ship design practice. This advancement is how we can be pretty sure that a ship like the one hit in the channel won't sink after a collision. Thank you to our wonderful supporters over on Patreon. Your ongoing support means that we can keep this ship sailing. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing and ringing that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next video. Hope to see you again soon.